one. Welcome back to the Upper Transfer Show, the transfer show we bring you each and every week on the Upper Tier Podcast, on the Dynamo Podcast Network on YouTube. Head over to YouTube, smash that subscribe and bell notification button. Audio versions of the show are available on Anchor. And as always, joining me, my partner on the transfer show as always, Dean Fitz. Dean, how you doing, my man? Couldn't be better, Noilish. Couldn't be better. The sun is shining. You know, us Irish people, it doesn't take a lot to keep us happy, but when the sun is out, we are happy. That's it. Sun out, guns out. Um, before we get into the transfers, let's have a quick chat. You obviously weren't around during the week for the um the match reactions for both European Cup finals. Um, touch on Wednesday, United Villarreal. Um, yeah, I could sit here and glow about Man United not winning a trophy but uh, I'll try and be as professional as I can as, as good as it is to see them lose in the European final but um, I just thought it was another game where and I know we seem to single them out a lot but I thought it was another game where Bruno done done nothing in a, in a big game um, people say it's fatigue and what have you but look Ole rested these players for the Leicester game Thought it was all going to play a part in them stopping us getting top four. It was going to keep them fresh for a European final, but um, I thought I thought it, he got it all wrong. Look, he went with his strongest eleven. Let Let's be honest, he doesn't really have much faith in anybody that's on the bench. Um, left it too late with freshening things up. I do believe if he'd have made a couple of substitutions around the 65th, 70th minute, possibly Juan Mata. Uh, Donny van der Beek um, but I think you know you could have nicked it but they just didn't seem to have anything going forward um, Rashford just talk to him he's been playing all season with an injury you know surely Ole knows that he, he knows he, obviously he knows the squad he knows the strongest level but I just didn't see much from United in terms of hunger passion desire you know in the European final Regardless of you know, he'd had a, had a decent season, like let's be honest, he had a decent season. But you would just think in a European final that these so called big players were torn up, and that's no disrespect to Villarreal. And um, but nobody gave them a sniff. We heard Craig's reaction completely agree, nobody gave them a sniff. There was no pressure on them whatsoever. They went out with their game plan. And um, I think they got lucky with the goal, he did scuff it a bit. I know Craig said he, he uh. I think it was Mark said that he he, he meant it. I did, I think if he'd have caught that clean, it was going over, it was going wide. They got so they got lucky with it with the first goal, but they were resolute. You know, you know, it had nothing going forward, and Villarreal were very very solid. Um, one thing I completely disagree with though is I've seen a lot of United fans turning on David de Gea. He should never have been in that situation. Let's be honest, the goalkeeper should never be in that situation. I know he had to take a penalty eventually, but at the end of the day, a penalty is a, is a lottery. A penalty shootout is a lottery, and he's not as, as fault at all there. The, the big players never showed up except for Cavani. Again, he worked tirelessly. He held the line on his own. You could see at times where he was screaming and shouting at players, saying they need to get more involved, they need to offer more. So I feel sorry for him. Um but totally deserved from Villarreal. Oh, I think over the 120 minutes, totally deserved. Yeah, I think it really showed the naivety of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer as a manager, really. I mean, he didn't react at all to the subs that Emery had put on. I then, found that very, very strange, Noel. Why I don't understand why you, make, you wait till extra time to make your four substitutions. It, it just didn't make any sense to me at all. Like it just He obviously doesn't trust anybody that's outside of his strongest 11. But still, they were tired, you know, they were running on the adrenaline of the longer this goes, gets closer to a penalty shootout, it's a 50-50 in a penalty shootout. I just don't understand why Ole left us so late. Um, they have to go out now and strengthen. It's, you know, if they don't go out and strengthen in the, in the summer with players who are going to take them to the next level, it's just going to be the exact same next season because, we get up, we put on Man City and Chelsea in a couple of minutes, but they're going to get left behind because there's a lot of players that were watching that Champions League final last night and I heard just talking about it on the, on the reaction. It was a 50-50. We got to Chelsea, we got to Man United, i.e. Jaden Sancho. Like you said, who do you want to go to? The European champions? Or do you want to go to Man United who are probably going to 
you know, finishing in the top four again is going to be the realistic target because I do not see Man United get anywhere near Chelsea and Man City, and that's that's excluding Liverpool. I don't see Chelsea or Man United getting anywhere near those two next year. Yeah, I think it's kind of, you know, when we talk about good managers and we talk about great managers, great managers are the ones that make those decisions in those moments, you know. Um, and I've seen a lot of United fans talking about, well, you know, should he have put Henderson in goals? Should he have subbed Henderson on for the penalty shootout? Because Henderson is such a bigger keeper with a bigger stature, so he fills out the goal more. And the fact that he knew about David De Gea's record in terms of penalties, I think what he he didn't even save the last 38 or 40 penalties he's had against him or something like that. And I was just wondering, is that the time? And no disrespect to David De Gea, obviously. But I wonder, is that the time? If Solskjaer had a sub Dean Henderson on, a lot of people, and imagine Henderson had a come on, and saved a couple of penalties for United to win the cup. Just, that that's when you get elevated into being a great manager, not a good manager. When you make those, you have, decisions. You have to make those decisions. Like, yeah, it's a cutthroat business, especially in the European final. The like way you're saying there, we're making the, the, the substitution of the goalkeeper. I've seen it in I've seen it in Pierce Park and Crumlin, um, in big you know with schoolboy football, the All Ireland competition. I've seen it happening. I've seen it. In, on the biggest stage, I've seen there's a, a lad plays for Crumley and I, I don't think he plays for now, but Dave and me, one of the best goalkeepers I've ever seen. And uh, he was brought on, no, actually, yeah, he was brought on in the cup final specifically for penalties. And he saved two and scored the winning penalty. You know, I'm not going to sit here because you'll have your United fans that listen, and I'm not having a, having a dig at them. I know Mark and Wayne know, or Mark and Darren know how much we, we hate Man United. I'm not going to sit here and dig them out. I'm not going to rub it in. But at the end of the day, and I've said this for a long time, Ole is not a good enough manager to manage a club like Man United. It's a cutthroat business. He seems to not have that um, that belief in himself. He has no belief in anyone outside his, his uh, strongest eleven. But look, uh, Tim Krill was brought on in a World Cup, a World Cup or a European Championship match, specifically for a penalty shootout. And he saved three penalties. At the end of the day, you, you, you made the, the, the wrong decision on your goalkeeper that night. I know he stuck with the Hay in the in the European games, but that was a night where if he'd have stepped up and he'd have thrown Dean Henderson in specifically for the penalties on United won that. I think a lot of us would have had a lot more respect for Ole. Yep, hundred percent. Let's move on to um, I mean, last night the Champions League final was um I really enjoyed the final, even though it was yeah, only a too, one nil. But there was great tension in the game. There was, you know, the build up that you know they matched up really strong player for player. But um, when I seen the teams coming out, uh, yeah. the teams got released. I was looking at Man City, going, what the "Hell is this about?" Like Sterling has barely featured in the last two or three months. Um, Fernandinho, who's there, absolutely, he's there in Golo Kante in the middle of the park, wasn't there. Um, and I just felt it was a little bit weak in midfield where they could get a little bit overrun. And the likes of Kevin De Bruyne and Gundogan and players like that, Gundogan, they, they got into a sort of a battle in midfield that they didn't, they just couldn't win. No. And um, balls kept on breaking down, passes kept on going astray. And I suppose the naivety of Pep Guardiola was shown last night in, in full effect. What was you thinking? Yeah, 100%. And um, when I seen the lineups, I just thought to myself, this guy is. They, they said if he won the Champions League last night, he'd be considered the greatest manager of all time. For me, this fella here, um, Bill Shankly, Bob Paisley, and Alex Ferguson, Pep Guardiola should never be spoke of in the same breath as those three men. Um, the complete disregard and disrespect for Chelsea last night, going with that starting 11. Um, you know as well as I do from previous Champions League finals with Liverpool you have to show respect for the opposition but you also have to show no fear um, not playing Rodri or Fernandinho could have probably played Cancelo too um, yeah just not, not playing Rodri or Fernandinho and just throwing on that the, the, the five attackers especially coming up against uh, N'Golo Kante <laughs> 
I, I, I haven't even got the word to describe how good of a player he is. It's, it's abs- the career he's had is absolutely phenomenal. And last night, again, cemented his legacy as probably one of the best midfielders to do it. Um, he came out of nowhere at Leicester. He's won the World Cup with France. Um, the league with Leicester, he's won um, the, Europe, the Champions League now with, with Chelsea. Um, when I seen the stand, stand 11, I just thought to myself, this is all going wrong for Pep. Um, the, the worry is that now Man City losing that Champions League final last night, you know what's going to happen, don't you? It'll be a case of get two or three players out and let's go and spend another 150, 200 million at trying to get the Champions League. And just to go back to the, the touching on people talking about Pep being the greatest ever. Let's be real. Since he left Barcelona, he's not won a Champions League. Um, he went to Bayern Munich. I think he spent, what, four years there? Three years there. He was knocked out in three semifinals. Hammered by Real Madrid, 5-0 in aggregate. Hammered by Barcelona, 5-3 in aggregate. Knocked out in away goals to let down Madrid. And then with City. The 16 17 against Monaco, six all on aggregate, went out on away goals. Hammered by Liverpool, 5 1 in the quarter final, 17 18. Knocked out by Spurs, 18 19. Like Leon surprised them in 19 20 when they, they thought this was going to be that year. And then this this year, you know, for that man we spoke of as, as one of the greats, so well and good, he went to Barcelona and he had. The, the golden era of Barcelona that'll probably be never replicated again but, you know since he left them he's gone downhill and I just think it's down to naivety as well especially last night he got it totally wrong it was very very sad seeing De Bruyne coming off and having that Salah moment as well I just want to touch on that you know Kevin De Bruyne is one of the best players on the planet um, and you could see what it meant to him last night it's just a shame that you don't see that in other players because as you said Sterling playing last night Sterling doesn't even merit going to the Euros this year. He's done nothing. There was talk of Trent Alexander-Arnold. He's had a bad season. He's probably going to be left out. Why is Raheem Sterling a shoe in to go? He's done nothing this year. Playing him last night, that's like someone winning the lottery. He knows he had a bad season. and comes around to the Champions League final. Look, we're going to go. We're not going to play any defensive hold in midfielder. We're throwing you in extra. And Reese James was one of the match for me last night. He was absolutely outstanding. Man City fans saying it was because Sterling had a bad game. It wasn't because Sterling had a bad game. Reese uh, James last night was absolutely out of this world and fully, fully merits a position in the England team going to the Euros and starting as their right back. As boyish as I am to Trent Alexander Arnold, defensively, Reese James is better and he proved that last night. Yeah, it's a, um, it's England being spoiled with their riches at the moment, isn't it? I mean, to have Reese James and Trent at the same time is is outstanding for them. Yeah, it's not even as them as well. You, you look at how good Juan Basaka is as well, and he has he's not kind of sniffing the England team. It, see, the thing with Trent, I do think Trent will probably go because it's I'd say Gareth Southgate is looking at playing him in a couple of games in the midfield position. He touched on it in the last interview when the. the squad was announced saying that Trent, Trent offers more in different positions and I think he threw that in there because he's thinking about bringing Trent and he has that option as a, as a, a winger mm. or as someone playing in the middle of the park but um, yeah the, 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 the ladder in uh, the riches at the moment um, defensively that, that they look solid enough but it's getting those getting those decisions on the, the attacking players for me Raheem Sterling doesn't go to the Euros very good player well, if it's going on this season alone and they were touching on Trent not going because of this season, then Raheem Sterling shouldn't go. Yeah, I suppose it's trying to find the balance between current form and potential form and experience. Because the one thing you look through that you know or that England squad, and we touched on it with Craig the other day in an episode, there's an awful lot of youth in it that lacks experience that will need that guidance. And that's why I was saying to Craig the other day that Jordan Henderson is so pivotal that he goes because of that experience that he brings within if, the squad. You know, if, if Jordan Henderson is only going to play a big part, he still 100% has to go do it. Talking about where Harry Maguire last uh, on Wednesday night, he was he was on the bench. Now, we, we thought he we, we kind of knew he wouldn't play, but they need Jordan Henderson. He, the, the, the squad is, is heavy. The England squad is heavy on midfielders and attackers. 
they, they need to bring Jordan Henderson. As you said, there's a lot, a lot of youth in there. And Jordan Henderson is a born winner. He's won the Premier League and the Champions League the last couple of years. He lost out in the league one point. But I go back to that when we were in New York for WrestleMania and that Southampton game and Liverpool are losing one nil. Jordan Henderson, I mean you looked at John like we're chasing a league here and he's bringing Jordan Henderson came on. And I always say this to you, he came on in that game, he scored a goal and got an assist. And since then, he's just taken it to a whole other level. You have to have players like that, even if it's just to get into the dressing room before the game. To, to the England squad now is what England, the England squad had back when they had Tony Adams, you know, Terry Butcher, stuff like that. You need those, those vocal loud presences who know, who know how to win games. Yeah, I remember. I remember that that day we were st- sitting in Carragher's bar, and I just remember when Henderson came on. Me and you were looking at each other, going, "Good what lord!" The <laughs> and the next thing, the assist on the goal, and you just turned around and stared at me, and it was that Undertaker Brock Lesnar moment dropping the streak, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, what the hell is this? Yeah, it was just unreal. <laughs> yeah, let's get into some transfer news, then, because this is a transfer show. But I did want to get your reaction to both games because I know you weren't available, but it's important. <laughs> and I think most people are kind of in the same view on both games anyway um big news i suppose the big news of the week this week was liverpool confirmed the signing of canate um which wasn't a major secret but again it's liverpool going out with mike edwards doing their business nice and early getting it done laying down a marker um i think we already spoke about canate on a previous show a little bit of concern about injury worries there but i know they had been doing multiple medicals on him over the last few months to make sure that a lot of that is behind him. He is a big lad. He's still grown. He's a young lad. Um, and I think that a number of those injuries, they were pinpointed to some growth factors in them. And um, so that's being put to bed. The money's being laid down. The signing's being done. And it looks like he could be the partner for Virgil van Dijk coming into the new season. Um, yeah, big I'm lads. Looking, looking, looking forward to this one. Um, he hasn't played much. My concern, as I said last, when, last time we touched on this one, Mark was almost was that um was injuries as such and he wasn't getting much game time at Leipzig but he's look he's off with the, the French under twenty ones now he's at the he's at the European Championships under twenty ones. Um it's kind of like an early start of pre season for him, do you know what I mean? He's gonna come back and he's gonna hit the ground running. Like look if he if he stays injury free at the Euros he comes in and has a good pre pre season. I don't see why he doesn't start the first league game of the season. Um, well, possibly pending on who, who that force fixture is against. But I don't see why he doesn't start the force game with Van Dijk. I'm very, very excited to see where this goes. Um, very good with the, very good in the air, very good on the ground. He loves a tackle. Um, kind of takes that board and off fair to Van Dijk because he's our main man at the back. You know, he's the, the pace guy. He gets up and back. He seems to be the one who's let, let last man uh, taken on, like trying to cut out, cut out those chances because. If if uh, Kanate comes in and he's kind of similar, you know, frees up Van Dijk, then you know what I mean. Especially when you're playing the likes of Man City, you're playing the likes of Chelsea, which this year we obviously we were ex- exposed with who we are missing at the back. But yeah, very excited. Van Dijk's coming back. Gomez is coming back. Matip should be fit. Kanate is there. You know, Nat Phillips. Nat Phillips is there. Nat Um Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to. To having that luxury of having a fully fit for for me, Joel Matip is outstanding. He's the calmest centre back I've ever seen in football. On his day, he's as good as Van Dijk. People are saying I'm crazy saying that, but in my opinion, when I've watched him beside Van Dijk and he's been injury free, he's been colossal. He's calm. He's composed. You know, even going forward, he pops up with the old the odd goal. Uh, Joe Gomez, I do believe now with. If Phillips stays and Kunate coming in, we have very good cover there at right back as well. Um, because Gomez can play there. Um, Samiskis, I don't know what's going to happen now with him. Is he going to stick around and fight for his place? He could go up. I'm not a Greece in the Euros. I'm not 100 percent sure. No, I don't think they are. No, no, I don't know what's going to happen with him. Um, I do believe we need. A stronger, better left back to, to push up. Robbo totally deserves a break. He was for the last two or three months of the season, he was just dead on his feet. He's gone off to the Euros now. We need someone to come in at left back. Um, yeah, very, very excited for, for Liverpool summer now with, with transfers. 
hopefully we get a couple of big names in. Yeah, they've also been linked with Pats and Daka. And um, Craig has been talking about Daka quite a lot and how he feels he'd be um, a really good signing for Liverpool. Um, but it's, it's, Go ahead. No, go on, go on. Yeah, and no, I was just saying he's a very exciting player and stuff like that, and he wouldn't be a huge amount of money either, but um, could be a real good um, acquisition for Liverpool if it was to come off, you know? Yeah, he's only 22. Um, very good record with goals per game. Um very, very strong, very, very strong player. Oi for goal, you know. I don't think you go for big money. Um, if we're going into the season and we're keeping Mo and Sadio and Bobby, then adding Daka to the equation with Jota, you know, it's a very, very good option. You've got the boys for the big occasion when they're called upon. But I'm sure if we brought him in, if Origi is going to be going and security are going to be going, he will get a chance. Um you know, he get he get time to settle in as well. But uh, yeah, as, as I said, I'm very very excited for it. just getting that Champions League final, or Champions League football spot. Very very excited to see who else we can bring in. Yeah, United looking to use David de Gea as part of a deal to try and bring in Jan Oblak. Um, and this is kind of a weird one insofar as I can see why they'd want Oblak because he's really really good. Um, but I'd be really concerned. The, the problem they have is I think they've kind of they shot themselves in a the foot really with the new De Gea contract, didn't they? The 350 grand a week and stuff like that. It's a huge amount of money uh, for a goalkeeper. And it, I suppose the only thing they have going with David De Gea, his, his wife had a baby there a few months ago, obviously, and she's located in Spain. I'm sure he'd like to go back to Spain and experience you know, fatherhood first hand, especially with the COVID year that's happened and stuff like that. Yeah. So he Definitely. may be willing to take a pay cut to go back home, if you like. Um, and they would be looking to bring in Jan Oblak um, as part of the deal. Um, I think there's a lot of this information that's coming out at the moment. I don't know if you've noticed in the transfer news. There's a lot of information coming out at the moment about players being used as part of deals this year. Seems to be a huge feature. Um and it and it could be um it could be a lot of what we see in the next couple of months through the transfer window where a lot of players are going to be used as part of deals, especially as clubs are kind of tied on cash flow at the moment, especially with what's happened with COVID and stuff like that. They're going to use some of their assets to to pad out some of the deals to get them over the line. Yeah, we we touched on that a couple of times as well, saying that the transfer the transfer window this summer is going to be one of the strangest ones we've seen because. As we said, teams are strapped for cash, except for um, the likes of Chelsea, the likes of Man City, you know, um, that it's going to be a case of a lot of players are going to be involved in deals. We know what's going on with, with link guards, stuff like that, um, make weights. Um, that's, that's a... I, I, does all Black one really want to leave and let go of the year they've had? You know, they're going to build on the success this year, the Champions League football, breaking the dominance of Barcelona and Real Madrid again to go to Man United to, you know, even though they finished second, but they had a really good season and they didn't really pull pull away from Chelsea and, and Liverpool. Um, you know, we, we talked about this with Mark as well regarding uh, De Gea. That contract has shot them in the foot big time, you know. Um, they brought in Tom Heaton as well and Old Black coming in. Where does Dean Henderson sit in all of this then? Do you know what I mean? It's They need to make a decision with Dean Henderson. He's either going to be number one or he's not going to be number one. For me, they they, they twisted his arm last summer, um, taking him away from Sheffield United. They've seen what a good season he had. He's made a couple of mistakes. All goalkeepers make mistakes. But with the Haya, nobody has the money to go out and give 400 grand a week and buy him out of his contract. Real Madrid have Courtois, Barcelona have Ter Stegen, let go have Old Black. It's a very, very sticky situation that he's in. I reckon he does want to go back to Spain. He wants to be with the family. He wants to be with the baby and all. But yeah, I just don't see Old Black wanting to leave it. Let's go Madrid. And Dean Henderson is going to be caught in the middle here as to he's going to be saying, well, you're bringing in probably in the top five best goalkeepers in the world. But where do I sit all in, in all of this? Because if I'm not going to be number one, I'm going. Yeah, which which is why I'm thinking, I'm thinking if the deal does have any validity to it, I'm thinking that's why maybe Tom Heaton has come in 
that maybe that if they do do the switch, you would imagine if De Gea switches over, All Black comes in as number one. Henderson's not going to be happy about that because he wants to be number one. That's why he demanded coming back. <laughs> then if Henderson's decided he wants to leave, they unload Henderson, make a few bob, and Tom <coughs> becomes the number two. Because, I mean, the number two goalkeeper, what does it re- in reality, what does it mean? I mean, De Gea's not going to be happy sitting there at number two, not at this stage in his career. Um, Henderson's certainly not going to be happy sitting at number two, even if it is Jan Oblak who comes in, because he just wants to be number one. He wants to be playing, obviously, which is fair Chelsea, enough. Chelsea are in the same situ- situation as well. Like We went down and bought Alisson at the time and was the most expensive goalkeeper in history. And then Chelsea went down and bought Kepa. Had a couple of bad, well, I know he had a few bad games, but a couple of bad games that st- stood out. They went down and got Mendy and look at the situation he's in. So yeah. who's to say that he doesn't go to the left go Madrid? Yeah, true. Um, but I don't know. I think I think that the thing, the defining thing about it is, as we said about last night, if you're a number two goalkeeper at a club that's the European champions, that's a very different situation. Um, because you want to be around the champions, you know. Um, yeah. A lot of talk coming out this week about <coughs> El Poch um, leaving PSG <laughs> and potentially going back to Spurs. Um, what you thinking on this? I've oh, see that this week alone, my brain has been fried. I'm losing track. I'm mixing names up. The amount of managers this week who've been sacked or left clubs. You've Pirlo, you've Zidane, talk of Poch going, Allegri, like. It's every time you pick up the paper, you go on to the football, the football room or uh, Twitters and stuff like that. It's just managers. And I'm like, so I'm saying to yourself, it's, it's nearly like the way the football transfer window is going to go. Like Poch goes back to, goes back to Spurs, Sedan goes to PSG, Allegri's gone to, gone to back to Juventus. Where's Pirlo going to go? There's talk of Conte might be going to Spurs. Like it's, if you're, if you're, a, if you're one of these fans who just, loves managers you're going to have a great summer <laughs> yeah but, I, was, um, I was kind of thinking like we do a transfer show on a weekly basis we, a managers we could nearly do a managers one and a players one the way it's gone but, um, um, yeah go ahead it's a, it's a big uh, it's very embarrassing though for Daniel Levy isn't it he he obviously knows he got it wrong you know um, and I do think that clutching our straws now that if Poch comes in and that friendship and relationship he had with Kane May may keep Kane there, but again, even if Potch comes back, how much money is available? You know, in my what my way of thinking is the only way they invest in that squad is if they do sell Harry Kane. But if they do sell Harry Kane, and the money is invested, you're not replacing the goal he puts into the team. And for me, Son had a great season, but again, it was only when Kane was in the team. So it's it's, it's well for Potch. You know, he needs to be careful too. Because if he goes in there and Kane is sold and Spurs have another season, he's looking again sacked next summer. Yeah. But I mean it, it's I mean it's a difficult one for PSG as well now. They're after losing the French league, which is you know, that's supposed to be the at least the guarantee, you know. Here's a little scenario for you that I wanted to paint. Um huh. Obviously, Frank Lampard halfway through the season wasn't working out for Chelsea. Chelsea now messing about, pull the trigger, bring Tuchel in, go on to have a very good season, win the Champions League, get fourth in the league, unlucky in the FA Cup on the basis of a half a season. There's a lot of really world-class managers out there available at the moment. I don't think we've ever seen as many top managers available in the market. Is there a case for United to show their strength and pull the trigger on Oli and bring in a Zidane or bring in an Allegri or bring in a Conte? Or, I know. think I think Conte would be ideal for United. Um, look what he's done at Chelsea in his fourth season. You know what I mean? If United can keep the keep Pogba, probably not going to leave now. I, I know I was kind of. Nearly certain that he would, but I just don't see it happening now with Pogba. But I think Allegri coming in, you know, if they, if they can get a good goal scorer, if they can get a good centre half coming in, the stock of Pau Torres, and um, let's talk of them getting Kane as well. But they, they need someone. Conte has the, the bucket loads of experience. Um, someone like that coming in, 
who who won't shy away from making the decisions that we said all day is afraid to make. I I do think, and as a fan looking like from the outside looking in, and I'd like to think that some United fans would agree with me that now is the time. Look, ole has been there for three years. He's not delivered anything. I think this season was as far as they go regarding the challenge for the league, unless they make that decision. I think now was the time, a fresh start. He's been there for three years. Roy Kane talked about he needs to be given time. I think three years as a manager is plenty of time, considering what, what they've done to David Moyes. Um, and with the names that are available, you're not really going to get the opportunity again to do it other than this summer. Um, Conte will attract big names. The fact that it's Man United and a manager like Conte. So if I'm a Man United fan, I'm looking for Ole to go and get in, in said names. Yeah, I just said I'd put it out there. I mean, obviously, I mean, there's talk at the moment that they're going to renew his contract and give him a new, give Ole a new deal. But I'm just wondering, is a time, I mean, you see what Chelsea did. You know, there's no love, there's no romance. It's look, this is where we need to be. If we want to be at the top of the dining table at Europe, this is what we got to do. Um, and you know, you can't show that. And although Soldier has been a legend for the club or stuff like that, you can only live off that that meal for so long, you know. And I just think, I just think, is there an option? There is there an idea there that maybe they should be looking at it because you know yourself, if they give if they give Ole a new contract and next year it doesn't pan out the way it should. It looks like they're going to have a long summer again of trying to sign players. It always seems to be drawn out with them. Um, I thought they would have done, I mean, obviously Tom Heaton came in fine, but obviously I thought they would have been doing a lot of business a lot quicker than when the Euros comes up and stuff like that. But I just I just think, you know, if they give him another contract and next year it doesn't work out and he struggles again, um, and we see just little small improvements, you know, like the improvements have been really small in reality, you know. Um, you know, your fans will come out and they blame, they blame uh, the Glaciers. Like it's not, it's not the Glaciers. I've said this umpteen times. They've pumped millions. There's always been money there available to, to bring players in. They brought Pop in. They brought Fernandez in. They brought Harry Maguire in. Like the, re-signed, the re-signed Cavani. Resigned Cavani. Like. For me, they're pointing the finger at the wrong people here. You see, United fans, the thing United fans is, like, Bruno's had a full, a full season under his belt. For me, he's, he's shied away from every big game they've played in. Like, do not go, I'll argue until I'm blue in the face with United fans. You know, and they'll talk about, oh, but there's no, there's no one else there. That's not his fault that there's no one else there. You know what I mean? Big players turn up on big occasions. We've seen it how many times. Look at Steven yeah. Gerrard in a, in a bad Liverpool team. Many times yeah. he's, he's dragged them through the matches. Fernandez had the captain's armband the other night. Cavani was the one going around giving the orders. You know what I mean? He's yeah. the guy that should be captain. He's a born winner. He's old school. He's been around the block a, lot, a long time. For me, and the, the worrying thing we United is, well, the fact that Ch- Chelsea won the Champions League final, Klopp still has that appeal. I don't know how much money is going to be made available by FSG. We know what Man City are going to do now that they lost the Champions League final. Um, like Leicester, Leicester are going to be very smart in the transfer window as well. They've got some very, very good players like Castagne, uh, uh, Falfane, the two boys that are playing left back, the two lads that came through the academy. They've made two signings this week as well. They're going to invest smartly. You know, yeah. United, United need a mass clear out as well. Like this isn't a case of they bring in two or three players and United are going to win the league. You look at that bench the other night, they need to ship out about eight or nine players. So it's not going to be a case of you go out and buy, as I said, two or three players and the world's your oyster and Man City better fear us. It's not yeah. going to be like that next year. Yeah, I just I just started thinking aloud, you know. I think like if you have a Zidane or an Allegri or a Conte in there the other night, my thinking is United would win that Europa League. Um, but then if you have those boys in there, you're thinking they probably wouldn't be in the Europa League. They probably would have gotten through into the latter stages of the Champions League. So I'm just wondering, just putting it out there as an option, is it an idea? And I mean, if there's United fans listening, come in the comments and let us know what you think. I mean, obviously there's an affection there with all and stuff like that. And there is little signs of progress at times, but is it enough? Is it enough for a club like Man United? And, you know, the fear, as I said, is in a year's time, if he, if he re-signs the new contract, then in a year's time, you're not happy and you want to get rid of him. All these boys at that stage will probably have jobs. Allegri's going back to Juve, as far as I know. Conte yeah. ain't going to be hanging around. He have, probably has a job lined up. Zidane is going to have a job lined up. He didn't just walk out of Real Madrid for nothing. Well, um, he's going to PSG. That's yeah. in my opinion. That's where he's going. See, the thing with Ole as well, like, 
there's only one way if Ole leaves United and it's down because no top team in football is going to be after, going to be chasing after him. Like you look at your Barcelona's, your Real Madrid, your PSG's, your Lille, anyone else or the Man United in the top six, top top eight of the Premier League. Like he's not, he doesn't appeal as a manager. He's not shown anything over the last three years. Whereas, uh, well, if Ole gets sacked, let's bring him in. Like Inter Milan ain't going to want want him. You know what I mean? AC Milan ain't going to want him. He's not yeah. going to be chased by any big team in football. Yeah, I mean they say they say he was a lucky, he's a lucky manager, and that's probably true yes. because I mean the timing of everything, the way it unfolded with Jose and needing to bring him in in order to wrap around that culture in United and stuff like that and do that. So luck and timing was everything, I think, at that time anyway. You know what I mean? One hundred percent luck and timing everything because he came in and they went on that run and the fans got behind him and it was a case yeah. of he's doing okay, let's give him that deal. He got that deal. You know, they go through a bad patch, but then they have a little, like a little two, three months. Like, mm. Fair enough, all this season they were unbeaten away from home. What did they win? Nothing. Like, there's no trophies for going unbeaten away from home. Mm. You know what I mean? Liverpool, fair enough, we won the league at the end of it. But look how long we went unbeaten at home. You don't fucking automatically, yeah, there's there's a 20-point head start in the Premier League next season. So all this United fans saying, oh, but we were great, great away from home. That, that doesn't mean, that means absolutely nothing. Nothing yeah. in football. News, um, news coming out this week from Real Madrid that they're open to offers for Hazard and Bale. No surprise to anyone. Um, what, what you thinking on both these? Yeah, the mass revamp is going to be going on there as well. Real Madrid are absolutely shitting themselves because it looks like Ferran is going to go this season. Ramos is coming towards the end. Um, they've put all their eggs into one basket with that deal that they've gave David Alaba. Um, and I think now the way that the standard in European football has dropped off the Richter scale, they know they need five or six players. It's not like it used to be where they could just go out and buy the five best players in the world and everybody trying to catch up on them. It's For me, they made a mistake pumping that 500 million into the stadium. The Bernabeu doesn't need a roof. You know what I mean? Um, they're trying to modernise the stadium, but They've caught themselves out now, and the only way they can make that squad stronger is by getting rid of said names, trying to bring in about 200 million, and then going out and trying to get Haaland or trying to get Mbappe. But for me, who's going to want them? Chelsea, in my opinion, don't need Hazard. Um, plus the money that it's going to take to get him and the wages he wants. Maybe they will for the whole love affair that it's Ed Hazard, but for me, they need fresher faces. Plus he's had a bad year with injuries, so do you really want to invest money for someone who's probably going to miss a tour of the season? And then again with Bale, I don't know where he goes. I really, unless Bar- uh, Real Madrid cut his cut the demand and his uh, selling price, I don't see anybody going in for him realistically um, and we know he'll be more than happy to go off to the Euros with Wales he loves being with the, with the lads the international team and then uh, he'd have no problem going back to Spain and playing golf five or six days a week yeah it, it, it's going to be an interesting one in terms of Real Madrid isn't it because most of the market know their predicament so yeah. you kind of have them over a barrel a little bit which is very unusual because normally it's due the way around but um, you know that does a does a a problem there financially, if you like. So the if they that... lose, if they lose for and they're in big trouble, very very big trouble in my opinion. Yeah, although I suppose with um, Ramos not going to the Euros, it gives him a whole summer to recoup and recover and get ready for the new season. But again, it it depends on what happens there. They'd hardly it'd be very difficult if they were to lose both, you know. Um yeah, Ramos probably only has one good year left in him as well. You know, he's starting to pick up those injuries as well. Varane is still really young. Yeah. They, they need to be going to Varane and saying, look what happened this year. We didn't win the league, we didn't win the Champions League. But look, yeah. we can get in a few new faces, build a team around that spine. Look, there's some lads coming through there that are very good, but the likes of Vinicius Junior and all, like he had one brilliant game against Liverpool over in Spain and he's not really done much outside of that game so if they're going to be keeping Varane they're going to have to make a promise and they're going to have to stick to it because for me Ramos is coming towards the end he's starting to pick up those injuries that are probably going to get more and more um, a regular thing 
And if they lose Varane, yeah, it's just, I just see big problems for Real Madrid. And not only that, I mean, you have Benzema up front, who's outstanding. But I mean, again, he's getting older all the time. Like, you know what I mean? So yeah. You can't expect him year on year to continue doing what he's doing, you know. Exactly. I don't know. I, I think with a new manager coming in, I think Real are going to be clever enough to know that there's going to be a two or a three year rebuild here where they'll kind of be a little bit in the wilderness. Who do we see though? Who do we see getting the Real Madrid game? Do you see Conte going there? I I think he could because I think maybe mm. over the next year or two a, a defensive style of play might suit Real more so than the gung ho that you normally see. Um, but again, I I I think it depends on how it sold him. You know what I mean? I don't think. He may not have an appetite if he felt that Ferran was going to go and stuff like that, you know what I mean? Because he wouldn't have a whole lot to work with there. Um, yeah. And it, I well, suppose it depends well, what it depends what they promise him as well in terms of whatever money's coming in from sales of players. Is he going to be given that money to use or is that money needed elsewhere, as you said, in terms of the stadium or whatever else, you know? So They need that, they need that kind of Mbappe signing who's going to come in and generate over 100 million in short sales, you know? Yeah, I just don't know. I just don't know financially if that can happen. I, I know, you know, there's a little bit of talk about it, but is it real talk? Um, I just don't know. I, I'd be very surprised. Um, if they were, if, if Real Madrid were were a uh, client of Nike, I could see that that extreme, uh, like, like really, really likely to happen. But again, yeah. Nike, Nike will have a say in wherever he goes. Obviously, we know that he's such a big brand endorsement for Jordan, for the Nike brand itself. Yeah. Wherever he goes is an extra 100 million in the coppers for any team. Mm. But Nike aren't going to say, yeah, you got to Real Madrid. They're, they're the Adidas. You put 100 million into their pocket. And like all we have is a boot deal with you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, the, I mean the branding and the 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 branding in the clubs now has become a huge factor as well. You know, especially at this high level, where you're talking about you know such an input from the brands in terms of the contracts and stuff like that. No, like that um, was part of the deal with Holland as well. Like you know, he wanted to, to sign all his image rights and stuff like that had to be his and his alone. That was part of the the deal wherever he goes. Who is this little pissant? Yeah, you're scoring goals, whatever, blah blah blah. But you know. Doesn't work like that, buddy. You've you've not won anything. Being top scorer in the Champions League is 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 not a trophy for your club at the end of the day. Whereas Mbappe, he's won a World Cup, he's won a Euros. You know what I mean? He's got the Champions League finals. Yeah, it's all about that. Um, those image rights, that endorsement, and yeah, that's probably why I don't see that happening with Real Madrid. Yeah, well, one thing that you touched on outside of the show that we've been talking about is um. Man City potentially selling Mares and Sterling. I know Sterling's been out of favour, which was the last month, a couple of months, which is kind of weird that to see him start last night. But he's been linked heavily with Real Madrid at times. Um, what you're thinking on this? I mean, you've already spoke to me about it, but yeah, the, that's my that's my only fear last night of Real Madrid, or Man City now in the Champions League because I I'd heard of this happening before the Champions League final, so I read about it yesterday on Sky Sports that the two dollars were for sale. Um, Aguero also leaving. That's a massive, uh, massive free up of, of wages for somebody. Last night showed that Man City need an out and out goal striker. And then with the set of available options, Mbappe, don't see him going there, um, leaves Haaland and Kane. So they're obviously looking at Pep touched on it, um, I think, at the start of the year, saying when it was it was announced that Aguero was going, that, um, you know, they don't have the money to go out and do what they, they, they usually do. So obviously that's where they're looking at. I'm very surprised that Mares had been on that list because he's been outstanding, I think, this year. But if they were to get rid of Sterling and Mares, we can only see one viable outcome, and that is the Haaland deal. Mm. Yeah, I suppose they could look at Lukaku as well, couldn't they? I mean, Lukaku would be a great acquisition for Man City, wouldn't he? Yeah, very, very good. Um, he, he, proved, he proved Man United wrong this year, didn't he? Top yeah. scorer. Uh, the second or top scorer in Serie A. Um, he's lost that bit of fat. <laughs> That, that he had when he was at United um, and he's just bulldozed through that league and um, fired into Milan to the league you you think you put Foden now on the left and 
we've seen De Bruyne playing now on the right now and Lukaku up through the middle. That's uh, that's a frightening prospect. Um, but yeah, come here, look, any top name now, any top striker in football now with Man City shipping out those two and Aguero going is going to be on the, on that list. And basically what it means is if those two go, they can get any one of those names. Yeah, he's also been linked with Chelsea as well, which is a frightening prospect if you think like the amount of opportunities they created this year that Werner didn't put away. Can you imagine if they created those opportunities for Lukaku and he was putting them away? The difference it would make to their season and in definitely, a full definitely. season. I mean, I think I think if Chelsea were to land Lukaku, um, I think you're looking at a proper real rival for Man City next season in the league. Um, I just think they'd be unstoppable up front, and with that, with that solid two banks of defence there, that two good players with as well, and you have Angola Kante in the mix. Pulisic, Kai Havertz coming back to form now after getting over the COVID and the long COVID. Well, I think Chelsea are going to be outstanding next season with a full season under two. Yeah, I said to uh, I said to Ian we, we had Ian on one of the shows and we were talking about and I was saying that Kai Havertz is going to be one of the standout players next summer or next yeah. season. Yeah, and um, that goal last night, his first ever Champions League goal, winning the Champions League, going off to the Euros in the German team that are one of the favourites to win it. You know, his confidence is going to be through the roof now. He's going to feel like he's six foot taller. Yeah. Like, he's going to come back in the preseason, like fucking Vince McMahon with the bleeding swagger. Um, they get they were to get Lukaku. The, the two said names that they're most likely to, to really go after are Lukaku and Varane. You look at that Chelsea team and put Lukaku and Varane into that. And Mother of Jays, as Man City have a fight on the hands next year. Like Thiago Silva will stay. You know, he'll be that leader, that experience for Rudiger and Varane. Yeah, you may as well fucking keep try and get one of them bombs out to try and break down that defence. It's a mouth-watering summer ahead in terms of transfers, isn't it, between managers? It's a mouth-watering season ahead for the neutral. Who's not yeah. a Liverpool fan, who's not a Chelsea fan or a Man City fan. Because if, if say, three or four teams have a really good start to the season and it comes down to a season that will be defined by those big teams playing each other all oh, them super Sundays are going to be fucking epic electric and we'll be covering them here on the upper tier no doubt just to let people know pleasure as always ain't our day and having you on for the transfer show every week um, coming up in the next few weeks we're going to be doing some Euro 2021 previews we're also going to be tracking the Euros twice a week with more shows on the upper tier and also look out for a new Liverpool podcast coming our way the Shankly Sessions it's going to be launching in the next week or so so keep an eye out for that as always head over to YouTube Dynamo Podcast Network the upper tier the upper transfer show um, if you want to anchor for audio versions of the show you can contact us on Facebook Instagram and Twitter the, the upper tier on Twitter and on Instagram, and we will chat to you again next week.